She was like, who do I get? Who do I have responsibilities? And who calls me and stuff? And I said, you know, about 50% of the people who who call me, they call me really for consultations, and what they're looking for is kind of like a a spiritual fortune cookie. Uh, they're people I know, but I don't have that relationship with, and they call me, and I haven't talked to them in a while, and they what they're really looking for is like some Yoda nugget, you know what I mean? And uh, and a lot of you guys have talked to you guys on the phone. I don't. I don't do that. And I told Carrie, I said, people seem to walk away disappointed from conversations with me. Because I, at this point, number one, I don't have any energy. And I'm usually doing something else while I'm talking to you. Uh, and also, I know firsthand, it's, it's not really filling. Meaning, I can, I can give you a pithy, quasi-spiritual quote. But, but you walk away hungry. 20 minutes later, it wears off. And you're like, wait a minute, did he say if you put... If, you, if your actions precede your, what was it, think about thinking or something, and it, and it didn't do anything, I said, so a lot of people that I meet, they call me and they're looking for a, a nugget, uh, and I don't, I don't have an easy answer, and, and so I think they, they get off the phone with me a little underwhelmed or disappointed, you know? Uh, we also talk about our influences and our, and our teachers, and my most, like Carrie said, my most valuable teachers, my most valuable the most valuable influences, they didn't, they didn't give me answers. I wanted them. You know, we all, have that, we all have that desire to meet the perfect teacher, the perfect person, the perfect whoever who's just going to do a lot of work for us. You know, I wanted that. I was severely disappointed in my early recovery because I, I imposed all these qualities on people and they didn't have them. They were imperfect human beings. And really what I was looking for is I was looking for someone who would walk the path for me, you know. Instead of giving me a nudge or a point and, and making me do it myself. Um, so, what what I want to do today, and I'm you know relatively relatively briefly. <laughs> I'm going to be brief. It's a good exercise for me. Three weeks ago, I, I got asked to speak at a meeting in Brookline, near where I grew up, and there was a uh, meeting on two, three, and eleven. So like my forte, you know, my GC. Nice, super intellectual stuff. <laughs> and I got down there and I was all psyched. I'm like, oh, I'll spend two hours on the second stay. <laughs> dinner. And I'll kind of talk about commitment, surrender, compliance for an hour and a half. We'll, we'll have a snack and a cheese plate. <laughs> and I got down there and the guy, he's a friend of a friend and he met me and he said, Matt, oh, so this, you know, you speak on steps two and three and 11. I said, well, I'm that guy. <laughs> And then he said this, he said, so you have 12 minutes <laughs> to speak on those three steps. He said, and then we do a 12 minute meditation and then everyone goes around. And I was like, oh, that won't work. I don't work in that format. I'm not a short story guy. I'm like Tolstoy. Like we need, we need a thousand pages. It takes me 12 minutes to say my name. And you could see that on my face. I was like, did they tell you who I am? Like, the guy who talks for a long time. And he's like, no, that's how we do it. And I was like, ah. <laughs> And uh, it turned out to be really beneficial. The guy who actually asked me to do it, who's a, a guy I've known, he was an alum of the PS or whatever, and he's a, he's a guy who's doing his uh, PhD in theology. And he said this to me afterwards. He said, I said, hey, you didn't tell me only had 12 minutes. And he laughed, and he goes, it's a good exercise, isn't it? <laughs> and he was right, man. It was, especially for a guy like me, who just... It was a really good exercise, and kind of what, kept, what Carrie was talking about, it was a good exercise for me to try and get me out of the way and not have to convince you that I am, I'm smart and I've been in the steps a long time and I'm spiritually fit and I, you know, I, I have the Wikipedia of the theological quotes, do you know what I'm saying? And I feel like I can summon them and blow your mind with some dust in them, you get it? And that was really, really good for me, and, and, and it's funny because I... Uh, I only spoke for 12 minutes, but I think it may have felt more authentic than anything I've done in a long time, because I had to get myself out of the way, and I had to, I had to try and be helpful in a very short period of time. So, uh, now that I've wasted a lot of time not talking about it, <laughs> I'm going to to talk about what I want to talk about. So, um, a lot of the, a lot of my, my teachers, a lot of my influences I never got to meet. Um, some of them I... Some of them were alive when I got well, and then they passed away, guys like Sandy D that we talked about. Uh, a lot of them, you know, died years before I was born. Uh, some of them died 700 years before I was born. Um, the guy I want to talk about very briefly, and, and I'm not going to talk so much as read some of his passages and just, hopefully they're 
useful to you, or I can share this guy who's been so influential on me. And it's funny, Carrie's friend just came over to say, I'm reading this book and you won't believe it because it's by a Catholic guy. <laughs> well, this is a book by a Catholic guy. <laughs> um, and this is a guy, without this book, I, I wouldn't be sober. And, and this guy was a monk, his name is Thomas Merton. Um, yeah. I read this, this is about almost 12 years ago now, that I, I was in a position right before I got sober, I literally, I had no money, I was homeless, I just got back from, from working in Mexico, if you want to call it working, <laughs> and uh, I actually went into a bookstore in San Diego, Borders, because it's like a library, but better, right? And uh, I, I picked up this book, and I, I opened to a page, just I'd never seen this book before, and I didn't pick the page, I just opened it up, and my eyes just went to this one little paragraph that I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll end with it, but in essence it said this, it says, so long as you pretend to live in pure autonomy without even a God to rule over you, you will inevitably become, become the servant of another man or the exiled and alienated member of an organization. Paradoxically, it is the acceptance of God as your true master that will set you free from human tyranny and from yourself. And uh, that was one of the most magical moments in my, my life. And that, that paragraph burned itself into my soul at that moment. And, and I was in a real crisis at the time as to whether or not I should steal this book. <laughs> it's like that I could use this and I really need it, but at the same time it's spiritual literature. Am I liberating it? Is it Shakespeare? Is it wrong? I did not steal it. I, I sold blood plasma and then I purchased it. <laughs> not making that up, 50 bucks for my human products. Some of you have done it, you know exactly what I mean. Uh, Merton, Merton, specifically this book, which is called The Seeds of Contemplation, it, it was an entry point for me into the steps because I had been exposed to the big book, I had been exposed to the steps, the same vector that a lot of you guys, either directly, indirectly, or you know, we're all kind of we're a family in this room. Some of us are brothers, sisters, some of us are cousins, but we're all kind of from the same family as far as our recovery goes. And uh, I've been exposed to the book, but my problems with 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 recovery, twelve step recovery, my crises, I thought they were unique because I think I'm really special, pretty garden variety, you know. Um, I thought I looked for God. I looked for God, I didn't find God, therefore in my mind I just proved the existence of God, you know? That's like opening your refrigerator and get milk, there's no milk, you're like, oh, milk doesn't exist. <laughs> you buy it, it's you just used to like your mom putting it in there. It's like, no, milk doesn't exist, it's a mystery. You know, someone bought it and put it in there, you know? And so, and again, I thought I was really special and unique, and my, my problem with the big book was, you know, all the anthropomorphic language around God and the pronouns, and, and again, I thought that that was a really special problem to have, and it turns out, as you guys are all know, pretty garden variety problems to have, crises to have, you know. Uh, Merton was the guy who gave me kind of the, the key. Merton bridged it for me. Merton was one of the first guys that I heard who talked about God as an experience, as opposed to an object. So, so Merton let me get access to the steps, and, and the stuff that I read in this book, and I only understood a, a very small part of this book, and still to this day, I come back to parts of this book. Like any good teacher, there's, there's stuff that I think I get, I'm so sure, I'm so positive, I understand it. Five years goes by, something else happens in my life, I take a look at a verse and I go, I didn't get that at all, and in fact, I was incapable of getting it until I just had that experience. And a lot of times, for me, those experiences are painful experiences. Because another source of confusion for me in the beginning was that when I heard the term spiritual experience, spiritual awakening, you know, in Western culture, those terms have been misappropriated by the spa industry. And we've been led to believe that spiritual crisis, spiritual awakening is supposed to feel like the first time you did MDMA <laughs> and went to Jordan's Furniture to go on a motion <laughs> on a Tuesday night because he's clearly a drug addict. <laughs> no friends. And, and so I, I kind of had that attitude that, you know, finding God, having a spiritual awakening, it was supposed to feel really good, which is why I was really confused, because most of my major spiritual experiences were characterized by pain and confusion, and I would have never labeled them as spiritual experiences in the midst. In the middle of my major spiritual experiences, if you said to me, Maddie, are you undergoing a profound and fundamental spiritual catharsis, I would have gone, no, I <laughs> and, and it was frustrating because the, the, the crew of people that I originally, you know, went through the big book with, 
the, the, the language that was used in my crew at the time was rather grandiose, meaning people would have a, you know, take their, read their inventories and they'd come out and everyone, how was it? The hand of God. <laughs> Support me. Like you felt that? No, 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 literally, giant monster fight on my hand. It came through the ceiling and it picked me up. Two angels, I think it was Michael, <laughs> Gary, Gary, <laughs> the archangel. Yeah, I thought that was one of them. I went to Catholic school, I didn't hear them. It took a suit of armor off me. Didn't, it was itchy, it was itchy armor. <laughs> and so, you know, all the, in my crew, I think we all got invested in trying to touch each other with the profundity of everyone's experiences. And, you know, I didn't have experiences like that. And, and I was so invested in wanting to be one of the guys that, you know, outwardly, it was, oh, dude, oh, yeah. And inwardly, I was filled with dread and anxiety saying I didn't have the right experience. And my first go around in this thing, that was so corrosive that it eventually shattered all my foundations and I told myself, you know, like once again, there's no God or if he is out there, like he's abandoned me. This, I, I was around people, like Harry said, once you're exposed to the truth, you can never unknow it. And I was in the presence of people who were truly well, so I couldn't deny it was possible, but I'm such like a pessimist and a narcissist at the same time <laughs> that I did this. Yeah, that guy's well, but it just won't work for me. Like I'm bulletproof when it comes to because my badness is so unique and special, even God can't cut through. <laughs> Merton, Merton let me in. Merton kind of he gave me an entry point, uh, and, and Merton talked about God as an experience. And like Carrie said again, not the experience you're expecting. My major spiritual experiences, it was only after I came through the other side that I realized I'm different. I'm different now. I'm different than before I went through. And it was, it was chaos, right? We have all this beautiful spiritual poetry, all this imagery about, you know, the desert, the wilderness, you know? And if you're a guy like me who went to a religious school his whole life, like you heard it, mm -hmm. it's background noise, right? And after I'd actually kind of traversed a few deserts, I went, oh, the math, that's too perfect. That's just too perfect, because that's, that's what it was for me. It was, it was a desert. You know, and, and no one could carry me through the desert. There were people who inspired me and said, just walk, just trust me. It's, it's, and you can't see it because it's on the other side of the horizon. You can't see over the horizon. You've got to have a little truck. I can't carry you. I would if I could, but if I do that, it's my trip, not yours. <coughs> so you've got to walk, you know. And Merton was one of those guys for me. So <laughs> I'm going to just read a couple of, a couple of verses, a couple of paragraphs of, of Merton. And uh, if it hits you, that's... Beautiful. He's way smarter and way more profound than me. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can go and you can, you can read him and, and steal his stuff like I frequently do. This idea of God as an experience, this idea of, of, of experiencing God, experiencing the divine, that was, that was pretty alien to me. And then the first time I was introduced to it was in this, this little half paragraph. The only way to get rid of misconceptions about contemplation is to experience it. One who does not actually know in his own life the nature of this breakthrough and this awakening to a new level of reality cannot help being misled by most of the things that are said about it. For contemplation cannot be taught, it cannot even be clearly explained, it can only be hinted at, suggested, pointed to, symbolized. The more objectively and scientifically one tries to analyze it, the more he empties it of its real content, for this experience is beyond the reach of verbalization and of rationalization. And that just killed me. Because I, I, check out the last two, right? Verbalization and rationalization. That is my whole gig. <laughs> That's everything I do. <laughs> Verbalize and rationalize, right? <laughs> Before I got so rapid, I got so. Before I got so, I'm not a big tough guy. I'm not scary. I couldn't love you. I tried to strong arm people in the depths of addiction to laugh at me. I could run a grandma. I'd be like, give me your money. She's like, honey, let me get you a blanket. I'm <laughs> <laughs> bad. She's like, you are, you're a bad shape. <laughs> I'm not a tough guy. I can't. I'm not a tough guy to know I am. I'm going to pull that off, right? <laughs> but I like to do this. And part of it's for you, but, you know, a lot of it's for me. And as far as rationalization goes, yeah, 
again, like Gary talked about, I want control. For a long time, I thought I wanted God. That wasn't true. I wanted to be God. <laughs> and I didn't understand that. I wanted to be God. I want to know what God is so that I can put God in a box and I can slap a label on him and put him in a pretty pink, coherent thought package. So you see what I just did? I caught God like, like he's a frog and I'm eight years old, right? I, I spoke at a, a retreat a few months ago. I offended one lady to the point where she left, which is not unusual for me. <laughs> and she did this thing where uh, Carrie and I talked about this too. After I speak somewhere, and Carrie has this experience, a lot of people come over, hey, like, cool, thank you, this, that one thing really resonated with me. But there's always one person who does this. I just, it was great, it was great to hear you, here's what I didn't like. <laughs> Which, like, I, you don't have to say that part. <laughs> like, if Kathy invited me to her house for dinner, like, how was everything, man? Like, oh, tofu, that was very considerate of you, you know, I'm a vegetarian, and I gotta tell you, the beans were great. Casserole sucked, Kathy. <laughs> Understand God, to solve the problem of God, to crunch God. And I, and I quoted this verse that I really love out of Genesis, because God has asked his name. And he answers in Hebrew, and you know, it's usually translated as I am that I am, or I am that I will be. You know, and I, I, I talked about my interpretation of that that verse, which is, you know, God has asked his name, and what he does is he gives, he gives a big middle finger. <laughs> and I gave a double middle finger. <laughs> I was feeling rather pumped that day. <laughs> People were laughing, and this lady was like, does he give a finger? <laughs> but that's what that is. You're not going to name me. You're not going to, because to name me is to have power up over me, to, is to identify me, is to bring God into existence. I can't bring God into existence. I can't cut God out from everything else. I can't put borders around God and treat God as an object, one object amongst men. That's the desire for me to be God, and that's what I had. I have a guy now that I quasi-sponsor, and he's a, he's a physicist, he's in school for physics, and he's a real sharp guy, and he talks. He'll text me, hey, have a minute, which translates as like, hey, have the rest of the night. <laughs> you guys have sponsees like this, you know, like the first two hours is nonsense, so you make a sandwich, you watch a couple of long orders. <laughs> I'll go, I'll go, uh-huh, yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's in there, I'm in there. I'll clean the bathroom, right? I won't, actually, that was a total lie, it's such a pig. I'll do other things. It's not involved me being, you know, contributing to my household. I'll come back, I'll hear him, I'll be like, oh, dude, we've all gone through that. I mean, I think we've all been there. 20 minutes later, I'll be like, I mean, yeah, man, those are growing pains in recovery. I'm not listening to anything. I'm watching growing pains, I think, at night. And I always say the same thing to this guy, and I understand where he is because I was there for a long time. When I do come back to him, and he, I say, are you done? And he goes, oh, yeah. and, and I have the same answer. I say, dude, God is not a problem to be solved. You're, tr you're trying to treat this like math. You're trying to crack the code. You're, it's not a problem. It's this reality to be experienced. You, you need an experience. And the, and the mystery, the mystery is a beautiful thing, right? I don't know what's coming next. I don't know how it's going to feel. That, that keeps things pretty exciting. That keeps it pretty exciting. It's not a problem to be solved. And for many years, that's exactly what I was trying to do. I was trying to solve the problem of God. And what I didn't know is I was trying to actually I want control, and I want to know, and I want to run the show, like the book says so many times, right? I want to be the director. I'm not the director. And when people call with those kind of problems, I say, good luck. I didn't figure that one out. I gave up. And, and I'm not going back because it takes a lot of energy, and it leads me to a lot of, a lot of suffering, right? I, I made it a little bit deeper into this book, and... Uh, <clears throat> This book started to talk about this this experience with the with the divine, and in and, and a very small nutshell, you know, Merton refers to it as contemplation, and that's oversimplifying it, but we've got limited time, right? And he talks about the things that get in the way of contemplation. One of the things that he talks about is pursuing pursuing God as if it's just another object. You guys have done this. I'm going to will my way through this, right? I'm going to get God, damn it. <laughs> And he says, it doesn't work like that. Again, you're just injecting your will into this thing. Right? And he talks about the other stuff that blocks me. He talks about this as, as my fundamental dishonesty. Right? 
First order dishonesty, what I call first order dishonesty is like George Costanza conscious <laughs> mendacity, which I was very talented at, you know what I mean? I lie to other people, and I did that frequently, and in fact, that was my only understanding of dishonesty is when you lie to someone else, which, which I did all the time. And, and lying to other people, as you guys know, it has, it has great consequences, right? The, the primary consequence is this, you cut yourself off from other people. And then you wonder why you feel alone. And like Carrie said, if I can't have a relationship with you, if I can't have a relationship with other people that I can see, how would I expect to have a relationship with God when I can't, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. I'm a man living up in my walled fortress complaining that no one's coming to visit. Yeah, There's this little parable I, I love about this preacher, right? Every Sunday this preacher, if he finishes his sermon, he's a pretty popular guy, he's pretty charismatic, and he finishes by saying this. He says, after services today, I'm going to drive a few towns away, he says, and I'm going to spend the rest of my Sunday volunteering with the poor. He says, what are you going to do? And everyone leaves feeling bad about themselves. And they were like, watch football and drink beer and, you know what I mean, shop on Amazon or something, right? Well, here's what happens. An angel descends from heaven and he, he hears this guy's sermon. And it turns out he follows this preacher. And this preacher does drive about an hour away, but he drives about an hour away to play 18 holes of golf. So he's been lying every Sunday, right? So these angels go up back to heaven and they talk to God and they say, hey, this is an outrage. This guy, every Sunday, he's guilting everyone and he's claiming to go do service and help the poor and he's going to play 18 holes, right? And God says, I'll take care of it. So the angels are waiting for God to take care of it. So the, the next week, God kind of comes down and this guy does the same thing. He says, today I'm going to drive an hour away and I'm going to spend the rest of my Sunday being of service to the poor. What are you going to do, right? Where God follows him to the golf course. <clears throat> Every shot this guy hits, God intervenes. It's a hole in one, right? It's the best round of golf he's ever played in his life. This guy is ecstatic, right? So God gets back up to heaven, and the angels go, Look, this guy, it's an outrage, man. Every Sunday he's lying about doing service work. You gave him the perfect game of golf, and God goes, yeah, but who is he going to tell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that little kind of cutesy folksy parable because it works on a few levels. You know, the first level when I first read that, it's like, oh yeah, he can't brag about it, he can't tell, right? But when you get a little bit deeper, it's a little bit more serious. If I can't share my joy with you, it goes rotten, it gets stale, right? If I'm alone, it's, 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 no, it's nothing. It's not real happiness, it's not real gratitude. It's me eating a pizza by myself in the closet, right? <laughs> and he cuts himself off. And that's that, that first order dishonesty, which was the only kind of dishonesty that I was aware of. When we talked about honesty in the big book, I thought that's what it was. Just stop lying to other people, right? And that, that kind of dishonesty, it comes with some pretty big consequences. You also get depressed and you also get anxious, as you know, because you have to spend all your time guarding your lies, right? But then there's this another, this, this next level of, of dishonesty that I, I, I wasn't aware of because, again, like, like a fish swimming in water, it was all around me. And that's that fundamental dishonesty that we practice with ourselves. And dishonesty is a weird word to put on it because a lot of it we're blind to. We can't see it. My favorite term for this is kind of the term that, that Carl Jung uses. He calls it the shadow. And a lot of different people call it a lot of different things, but Jung's term for me personally is the most poetic. I keep it behind me. It sits in the shadow. It's the stuff that I don't want to look at. Sometimes because it doesn't fit with my ideas about who I am, right? Sometimes it horrifies me. You guys all know this. You ever done something and then you find yourself apologizing, going, that's not me, man. I don't do stuff like that. Well, you did it, though. So what kind of happened? Right? <laughs> or for you guys while you were active, if, you, if, you're a, if you were an enthusiast of benzos and alcohol like me, <laughs> You left many terrible voicemails, didn't you? <laughs> and when you leave those voicemails, and if someone, I, I made a, I met once this while I lived in, in Portland, and uh, the girl I was dating at the time, I said, you know, if we can do anything, and she said, I want you to listen to what you said on those voicemails. Wow. And I went, honey, I know that you think this is going to be productive. That's going backwards. <laughs> we need to go forward. You know what? Let's do it together. Delete. Let's press it together. Let's hold hands. <laughs> and asked me what you could do. I want you to hear the things that you said because they were really disturbing. And I went, again, the past, that's behind us. The future's where we need to go, babe. And, and she made me listen to those voicemails. And I remember I listened to the first one after I had like three drinks and I went, because it was bad. And then I listened to the next one after a few more drinks and I went, oh, right? And then as we got deeper, it wasn't just cringeworthy, it was horrifying, because the things that I said, they were alien to me, right? 
Where would that come from? Well, where did it come from? I mean, that's the stuff in the shadow. It was so horrifying to me that I denied it was inside of me, right? And I'm living on the surface and I'm not looking at that. And until I address that, until I go in there, until I do what, what Jung called traversing the swamp lands of the soul, until I can bring that up into the light of consciousness, until I can embrace the stuff that's blocking me from God, guess what I'm not going to find? God. And again, that's me opening the fridge going, milk doesn't exist. <laughs> no, 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 you have, you have God in milk, right? And, and, you know, the nature of most of this work that we're doing, that's what it is. It's, it's looking in there, and it's going into the shadow, and it's finding that stuff, and it's uncovering the fact that I'm a, I'm a self-seeker even when, right? Even when I'm putting ten bucks in the box, right? <laughs> 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 Julian, oh, I can't reach the box because of this <laughs> and therefore my natural efforts to make myself more real and more myself make me less real and less myself because they revolve around a lie. Right? So I'm, I'm born in selfishness. It's, it's, it's true. When I'm born, I'm all self. I'm all, I'm all id, right? Babies are all id. Babies are just... <laughs> you guys, parents, or have a niece, right? Which I love my niece because I get to do fun stuff and then not... Right? <laughs> 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 Babies are all just give, 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 want, I want, I want, right? And then eventually, parents, you know this, eventually you kind of have to start setting up some boundaries, don't you? So that, that baby reaches for a cookie that's not hers, it's her sister's, and what does mom have to do? Stop. No, bad girl, right? No, not yours. Bad, right? <laughs> Now, now we got these two forces. Now we got my selfishness, and now I have constraints, meaning I'm being told no by my by society. In this case, my mom, right? No. And I, my mom turns around. I try and reach again, and when she turns around, she goes bad. And now mom's getting deeper in my head and forming this thing called a conscience, right? I got this weapon of guilt in there, bad. And now I got these two forces. I got all my drives and my desires and my selfishness, which just wants, 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 wants. But I got this other force beating it back, hammering me with guilt, right? And also, people tell me what it means to be a good person, so I come up with some idea of that. And when I don't meet my own standards and criteria of what a good person is, right? I feel more guilty. You guys, you guys know this. It's, we don't want to feel guilty. We don't want to feel bad, right? Especially this is all people, but we're. At the very least, we think we're more sensitive to it, right? We love saying that shit as a <laughs> All people experience that we're just exquisitely affected with the human condition. <laughs> but we need to get well to go and help the non-alcoholics who don't understand such lofty spirits. And uh, we love thinking we have a monopoly on that, don't we? Right? We're just more spiritual than other people. <laughs> we also cheat, by the way, because for us, it's like, you will do this or you will die. <laughs> did this just because you had some natural inclination, like you, you weren't, it wasn't like you could go to jail for a hundred years. <laughs> no, I just kind of felt this attraction and I responded to it and I'm like, what? <laughs> what? For, for us it's like, it's like the guy who joins the military because his other option is to go to jail. <laughs> Thanks for your service. He's like, hey, I was out of all the prisons. So. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> <What's> that? <laughs> that that discomfort I feel with, with guilt and being told no, and that discomfort I feel as a result of not getting 
But I want to gotta I gotta resolve that somehow, right? That selfishness, it's it's like a pressure cooker and it's bubbling over and then this this sense of self manifests, this ego manifests that's trying to channel that stuff and and take care of it and vent it in acceptable ways, right? And it doesn't always work. And when it doesn't work, what do I do? Well, I come up with a story, I come up with a narrative, right? <laughs> I had a uh, I had a, an ex. I had many exes, right? <laughs> and one of my life forever. <laughs> Tell her I said that, you know. <laughs> I had an ex and we had a lot of mutual friends and she finally left and she was pretty clear with me. I, I came into a one woman intervention and she told me this. She said, I've given you chances for years. She said, you don't take them, you don't pursue recovery, you won't ask for help, you lie to me. And she said, I'm leaving. And I remember I looked at her and I went, honey, what is this really about? <laughs> and it couldn't have been any more clear because besides, right? Like she had like a, it was a chart. And here's your percentage of her lies. She's like, you know, she had them categorized. She's like, so first quarter, 1997, let's just point out your, right? Like she was organized, she had her shit together. And I was like, What's it really about? <laughs> That's what it's really about. I and mean, she left. We had a lot of mutual friends, right? I had a story about myself. My story is that I'm a terrific boyfriend. Except if I was a terrific boyfriend, the truth is I wouldn't lie to my girlfriends and not consider her feelings, her needs, her spiritual and psychological well-being, right? So now I got this problem. So what do I need to do? I need to come up with another story. I need to come up with another lie to save myself from seeing who I really am, right? And we had a lot of mutual friends, and I remember bumping into a mutual friend of ours, and he said, hey man, what happened with, with Gretchen? Gretchen's another bad tattoo that I had. I told her that story too. <laughs> the name Gretchen tattooed on me. Bad move. After she left. So <laughs> <laughs> she totally failed, and I was stuck for a decade with the name Gretchen tattooed on me. Which is a rough name to have tattooed on me. It's not that, it's, we don't live in like an Aesop staple. <laughs> we don't Gretchen, right? But I remember bumping into a mutual friend who said this to me. He said, hey man, I'm so sorry, what happened? And my answer was this. I said, dude, you know, I don't want to get into her business, which means I'm about to get into her business. So I said, ah, you know, I'll just, but hang on, let me just tell you everything now. <laughs> said, dude, she's a great kid, you know that, she's terrific. It's just, she's got, I mean, a lot of, you know, stuff to work on. Eating disorder. <laughs> and, you know, man, I've been trying to get her help, but she just projects all that shit on me. And I mean, you know she's great. I hope that she someday gets the help that she so desperately needs. So desperately, desperately needs. <laughs> right? And then also tell whoever else. <laughs> now many years later, when I revisit this in an inventory, here's, here's what I find. Here's what's really scary. This wasn't the Costanza lot. You know what I mean by that? This wasn't me saying I have a house in the Hamptons with horses named Snoopy and Prickly Pete, right? This wasn't me just on the fly fabricating. I really believe that. Because the truth, which is I prioritize my own short-term ease and comfort over the well-being of any other person around me, which is real grown-up selfishness, as opposed to what I thought selfishness is when I came into the book. I thought selfishness was I wouldn't share my cookie with you, which is why I helped me to grasp the idea that I'm selfish. The guy who sponsored me for many years said, your problem is you were selfish and self-centered. I didn't even get offended by that because I went, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not seeing it. <laughs> I can see how that would apply to lots of people that you work with, but I think you got to look somewhere else. I'm not selfish, man. I'll give you my last smoke while we're at Deepak's. I really will. I always give one of those guys James. I always do, right? I help the little ladies carry bags. I always do. I always do these things. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> I was like, which baffled my mother for years. Her famous quote was this. She goes, you won't eat a piece of sawfish, but you'll put beetles in your eyes. <laughs> I drove her insane. Because I'm not a barbarian like you meat eaters. Because I'm like stealing 20 bucks. <laughs> Whatever, just going to fun corporate farming. I'm liberating it. Harold, right? <laughs> It's not me just lying. It's not me bullshitting. I really believed it because I was so I was I was so delusional about seeing who I really was. Right? I'm 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 so invested in the story that I don't know who I am. Right? Merton later in this book, by the way, he defines hell as perpetual alienation from your true self. And, and so for me, I did this over and over again, and, and I don't, and, and at the same time, I'm baffled as to why I suffer so much, and I feel so lonely, and I feel so much despair, and so much, 
nothingness and pointlessness and crushing sense of meaninglessness. And even when I'm around people, I still feel lonely. You know that? That awful feeling of around people and I still feel alone? Yeah. Well, it, well, it turns out what I don't see. I'm, I'm like a guy who's drinking seawater. He's drinking salt water and complaining about being thirsty. It's so thirsty, it's terrible. Oh, hang on a second. And I'm not willing to listen to anyone because I'm the smartest man in the world. So when someone goes, hey, dude, that you're drinking such... Wait, I need a drink because I... And I do get my relief. I get 22 seconds of relief, right? It's still liquid. It's still wet. You guys know you're swimming in the ocean. You get water in your mouth for a minute. You're like, oh, that's good. And then what happens two minutes later? I'm just thirsty, right? And I can't see that. I'm invested in believing that I'm a person that I'm not. So Merton goes on to say this. He says, People who know nothing of God and whose lives are centered on themselves imagine that they can only find themselves by asserting their own desires and ambitions and appetites in a struggle with the rest of the world. They try to become real by imposing themselves on other people, by appropriating for themselves some share of the limited supply of created goods, and thus emphasizing the difference between themselves and the other men who have less than they or nothing at all. They can only conceive one way of becoming real, cutting themselves off from other people and building a barrier of contrast and distinction between themselves and other men. They do not know that reality is to be sought not in division, but in unity, for we are members of one another. The man who lives in division is not a person, but only an individual. And so what he's talking about here is not necessarily going off to live by yourself, although he addresses that later in his book. I, I, get, I work with guys all the time, they go, I'm going to go, you know what I need? I need to go out to the desert by myself for 40 days, and I'm going to Nepal to live in a cave, right? I need, I need to get away. Mm -hmm. Later in his book, Merton Mer Mer calls that out. He says, if, you, if you're running away from people just to run away from people, Here's what you'll find. You'll get to the desert and you'll figure out that you have surrounded yourself with a tribe of devils, right? Because whatever you're running from, you're taking it. So he's not talking literally about that separation. He's talking exactly about what, what Carrie talked about, which is I'm always trying to get you to reflect back to me something because I'm hoping that I can mesmerize myself and fool myself into believing I'm really that person or a person at all, right? If I have more than you, then I have some distinction. And like a, it's like a, a the Invisible Man, remember those Invisible Man movies? Mm -hmm. I think if I can wrap myself in bandages, maybe, maybe I'm perceptible to you and the rest of the world. Maybe I can get some clear-cut division between me and you and I can actually kind of figure out who I am or maybe some sense of actually I am. <coughs> if, I can, if I can get you to believe that I'm the person that I want to be and you can fall for it, maybe you'll reflect it back to me and maybe I'll buy into the idea I'm that person too, right? So what happens in the end? It doesn't really work, even if I convince you. I feel the symptoms of that. And the symptoms of that, you guys have experienced this, ready? Emptiness, depression, anxiety, and a profound sense of loneliness, even when I'm around people, even when I'm the center of attention, which I like to be, right? <laughs> I'm the guy on stage, I'm the guy cracking jokes, I'm the guy in the middle of people, and I go, geez, I'm still lonely. How come I'm still lonely? Right? So, I'm going to, uh, how are we doing on time? Okay. I'm going to read just two more quick verses here that were really influential. And these ones are, are pretty applicable to what we're all doing in this room. The first one is a quick one on resentment. The second one's on spiritual pride. Here's, here's the first one I wanted to read. The most difficult and the most necessary pronunciations to give up resentment. This is almost impossible. Without resentment, modern life would probably cease to be human at all. Resentment enables us to survive the absurdity of existence in a modern city. It is the last ditch stand of freedom in the midst of confusion. The confusion is inescapable, but at least we can refuse to accept it. We can say no. We can live in a state of mute protest. Do you guys ever find yourself in love with resentment? Mm -hmm. And whenever I come somewhere, you realize you, you're, you, you have a resentment, baby? <laughs> <laughs> reevaluate who he is, right? Except or maybe I'm wrong, or maybe he's okay, or maybe it's not my job to change him. Maybe he is a jerk and it's just not my job to change him. Maybe that's his own business, right? I get resentment babies all the time. I call them like they're a baby, right? And I call my sponsor, and she's really good. And she's she's very, my sponsor is, uh, she lives in Israel, and she's like a totally different style than me, and I just 
you know, I worked with her for many years and I have great respect for her. She's got a very different style than me, and she'll make these suggestions. I'll read her eight pieces of inventory that didn't even need to be written in order to avoid my inventory being represented. <laughs> <laughs> and she's just so good, right? She'll be like, hmm. <laughs> good, I'm glad. She's like, you know what you might want to do, and I know what she's going to say. You might want to just kind of take a look at, uh, hmm, interesting. <laughs> All right, shalom then, I'm hanging out. <laughs> and I do this thing where I pretend to consider what she said. Um, I've been around, I've been doing this long enough to know, I won't give you an answer right away. If I really want to convince you I'm thinking about what you said, I'll just say it in my head, because that's the, the opinion I'm only interested really in hearing. When you say something, I'm like, yeah, and in my head, I'm like, and then three hours later, I'm, right? Oh, man. Yeah. Sometimes resentment lets us show us up, up, show us up in, our, in our position. And it defends us from discomfort. But he goes on, he says this, But if resentment is a device which enables man to survive, it does not enable him necessarily to survive healthily. It is not a real exercise of freedom. It is not a genuine expression of personal integrity. It is a mute animal protest of a mistreated psychophysical organism. Driven too far, it becomes mental sickness. That, too, is an adaptation in its own way, but it is an adaptation by way of escape, right? And we've all played these games. One, another one of my favorite books is called Games People Play, right? Some of them we talked about a couple of you guys a few weeks ago, about this guy, Eric Byrne. You know that you know that term, Mind Games? John Lennon wrote a song about it, right? This is where that term came from, this guy, Byrne. And in the back of his book, he lists all these different games that we play to avoid discomfort, to avoid looking at the truth, to avoid genuine connection and authenticity, because it scares the shit out of us, right? And there's a couple of games in there that, that they'll jump off. One of these games is this, it's called If It Weren't For You, I Would, right? And the example he gives is a wife. And this wife, on purpose, she chose a husband who's a total couch potato, he doesn't like to do anything, right? Doesn't like to do anything. She's not consciously aware of the fact she chose him to do that, but, but here's why she chose this guy. She lives in deathly fear of failure. And so here's what she says. She goes, let's go take salsa lessons and do that salsa dancing. And of course, her husband that she picked, being a couch potato, what does he say? No, I don't like the salsa. We're not going to do that. And here's what she says. Oh, if it weren't for you, I'd be out there salsa and up in the Macarena. <laughs> you know, <laughs> You guys see it? Everyone seen this, by the way, in your own inventory? I asked you a question, I already know what your answer is, because then you get to save me from taking a risk, being uncomfortable, possibly failing, right? I get to live in safety, and I don't have to take responsibility, I get to go and tap it. Yeah, I would, I would have done it as tap it, you get it? Another one of the games in there that'll jump out, especially if you're in recovery, is called Now I've Got to Use Some of It. <laughs> and here's the example of to this thing. There's a guy who hires a plumber, right? And this guy said, this is an angry guy, but he's, he's like a lot of us. He's angry, but he won't admit he's angry. And he becomes so angry that he becomes dissociated and detached from his anger. And so his anger comes out in all these other weird ways, right? Most angry people don't believe they're angry. I was a very angry person, but if you asked me, I was like, you don't like Jeff Spicoli. Spicoli <laughs> Lebowski anger? No. My problem is everyone else stops. Right? <laughs> and so this guy hires a plumber, and here's the plumber says to him, it's going to be $400 on the dock, not a dollar more. And the guy says, great. He hires the plumber. The plumber comes and submits his bill, and his bill is for 403 bucks. So three bucks, whatever, right? This guy calls the plumber, and he just destroys him. Not only does he call him dishonest, but he, he launches these series of personal attacks on his integrity, right? And the amount of anger that he's got and the fury he unleashes is wholly incommensurate with a $3 upcharge, right? And finally, the, the plumber is so shocked by this, he's like, look, I'll, let's make it $3.97. Make <laughs> it six bucks back, right? And in the end, this guy is secretly delighted that this plumber committed this little infraction. Can you figure out why? He, won't, he doesn't know why he's angry, he won't even admit to himself he's angry, but that anger is bubbling, and so anytime anyone slights him, even if it's perceived, he pounces on it to get some relief to fire off that anger, but remember, he, he doesn't want to see himself for who he really is, he wants to see himself for who he thinks he is, so he gets to make the anger righteous by saying, he did the wrong thing, not me, right? Mm -hmm. He did it, not me, you get it? He did it, man, he overcharged me. It's the wrong thing. Yeah, it was, but... He was happy he did the wrong thing, right? 
I've, I've written inventory in the past where I find that I'm supremely pleased that you did what you did because it gave me license to talk shit about you. And if someone says, we've been talking shit about Casey, I'd be like, oh, did you hear what she did? <laughs> and I'm glad you did it because now I can talk shit about you and talk about all this and that and the other thing. And guess what I have? I have evidence, right? You really did it. You get it? She really did it. Damn. I'm like a law and order district attorney. I can feel it out. Well, I did say that, but that's because she did that, right? I get to shore it up. I get to justify my anger. I get to make my anger righteous. I get to dress it up, right? But again, like Merton says, in the end, who does it burn up? And just in the big world, this is we, we get resentful. We shore up all this justifiable anger, and in the end, we're angry. And it cuts us off from the sunlight of the spirit. You all know this firsthand. Ask yourself this question: Can you simultaneously feel like you want to choke the life out of someone and also feel like you're walking in the sunlight of the spirit? <laughs> They're opposites. They wash each other out. Right? I don't feel like I want to kill you. I want to cut off from you. I want to cut off from God. I can't have both at the same time. And I'm a really sick guy. And if you if you wash up the sunlight of the spirit long enough for someone like me, here's what happens. I hurt almost everyone around me, and then the punctuation mark at the end is I take a drink or a drug. But that's all the punch. That's the exclamation point. It's everything that leads up to it will be probably, arguably, worse than me actually drinking or doing coke. At least when I'm doing coke, I'm hiding in a basement. And not <laughs> the general public is sick for me. Right? But you get me spiritually sick and sober, man. I am a dangerous weapon, aren't I? And I can pull the big one. That's really dangerous. I make you feel really crazy and bad, right? And I'll shore up everything I say by taking things out of context, right? He goes on and says this, ultimately it is a question of servility, and servility may be a purely subjective condition. It may be that we regard ourselves as slaves even when we are not dominated by anybody. It may be that we are not capable of existing except in a state in which we imagine ourselves to be under domination. So this is going to tie into that Eric Byrne game. Check this out. In that event, resentment may help to make the situation acceptable, but it can never make us healthy. It is only a justification, a pretense, that we would be free if we could. But what if we discover that we are, in fact, already free? It is not that someone else is preventing you from living happily. You yourself do not know what you want. Rather than admit this, you pretend that someone is keeping you from exercising your liberty. Who is this? It is you yourself. But that's terrifying, isn't it? Freedom. We all think about freedom. It's very American, isn't it? <laughs> Truck. <laughs> <laughs> but freedom is really scary. Freedom means freedom. What's implicit in that is you are now responsible for what you do with that freedom. Be it a big freedom or a little freedom, right? Even the freedom you're on, you're, you're, you're buying something. You freeze up. Well, what if I make the wrong choice? What if I hate that? I'm stuck with it, right? So most of us, we think we want freedom, but at a deep level, freedom really, really scares us. So I'd rather, I'd rather get rid of my freedom and not own the fact that I want freedom <coughs> and be able to blame it on you. I'd be happy if only, right? If only, right? A lot of us, when we, when we write an inventory, we find that our whole moral system, our whole ethical system, it's all, it's all reactive. I, I, it's, it's all based off of resentment, right? I'm that guy, I would sit in a meeting, the first speaker would speak, and what do I do the whole time? That guy sucks. <laughs> right? I'll find fault with, like, it has nothing to do with him, I'm just angry, you get it? But my anger exists before my thinking, which has to arise in order to explain my anger to myself. My feelings always come first, and then I come up with a short story of bullshit to explain to myself and my feelings. <laughs> But I'm reacting off my feelings, which subjectively are real to me, by the way, but they're not based on reality, which is crazy, right? <laughs> That's why I did it crazy, right? The second speaker could come on, say the polar opposite of the first speaker, I'll still find fault, right? Everything I do is based on this childish rebellion, which I thought made me original, but ironically, what does it make me? Not only a child, but also, there's nothing creative about that, is there? You get it? My whole identity is based off of the thing that I claim to rebel against. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's like if you made a sculpture and it was really beautiful out of marble or something, and, and everyone's like, wow, that was terrific. And I picked up the scrap pieces, and I'm like, oh, guys, check out what I did. You didn't really do that. That's the excess, right? 
my, my whole worldview, my ethical system, if you want to call it that, that's what it was based on, childish rebellion. Whatever you have, I don't have. I'm angry at you. I target you. So I just distance from myself from you. I talk shit about you. I demonize you. Which means whatever is furthest from you must be good. I'm furthest from you, so I'm good. Mm -hmm. Get it? You guys see how unoriginal it is, though? It's ironic that this guy has considered himself to be really original and a pioneer. My story about myself is just based off of just really petty resentment. I'm just a negative form. I'm the stuff that you carved off when you did something good and created, right? It's easy to be a critic, you guys know that, isn't it? It's easy to tear things down. That's really easy, right? You can only define style in the negative that way. You can never truly be creative, can you, right? He goes on and he finishes this. He says this, he says, but as long as you pretend to live in pure autonomy as your own master without even a god to rule you, and that's the first thing I ever read in this book, you will inevitably live as the servant of another man or as the alienated member of an organization. Paradoxically, it is the acceptance of God that makes you free and delivers you from human tyranny. But when you serve him, you are no longer permitted to alienate your spirit from human servitude. God did not invite the children of Israel to leave the slavery of Egypt. He commanded them to do so, right? So he says this freedom is already here. And it's, and it's waiting for you if you're willing to let yourself free from that captivity. The last thing I want to I wanna talk about is, is spiritual pride. This has been on my mind a lot lately because I've seen a lot of damage done. And there's two forms for me of spiritual pride. I'll, I'll read briefly about both of them, right? The first one is, is more evident. It's what Kerry talked about when you're really proud of your humility. You look around the room going... <laughs> Usually, you guys are just in a meeting, someone's talking, and you go, this guy needs to be humble out of here. This guy needs a good dose of the old vitamin H. <laughs> Part of you, so you're not resentful or anything, you're like, nobody laughs soon. <laughs> nobody laughs soon is a way of you wishing that they'll relapse without admitting to yourself like that you're wishing someone would feel that. You know that thing? You're not resentful, right? <laughs> We get calling the herd, we get message to the rest of the community. We shouldn't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big resentment. So you just you kind of put it in a different con. You changed it syntactically, but that's a kind of wishing that someone would be like, Don't look horrified at you, got it. <laughs> Somebody did it this morning. You're not the neuter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gave him 10 bucks, right? <laughs> and you look around going, Yeah, I'm working on humility, and I'm glad. I'm around a bunch of people who aren't humble. Probably not. That's the most humble I've ever been. You know what? I can feel good about that. I've the the people of humility. We see it. We see it two ways, right? We see it two ways. One is one is this, and this is this has been a tragedy lately. You guys have seen this. Social media. Now, this breaks my heart sometimes. You see a guy with four months of sobriety, someone makes a video of him and puts it on the internet. And it's ultimately it's an advertisement for whatever. Which to me just breaks my heart on so many levels. It's prostituting this guy's experience and his recovery and it's using him. I, I, I read this the other day. Remember, you guys probably remember this. It was awful. A married couple overdose and someone filmed it because that's. What? Yeah, that's who we are now, right? Oh my God. And they put it on. And here's what's even more heartbreaking. Two days ago, I'm looking. Some treatment center took them in and whatnot and gave them free treatment, which at first you're like, that's awesome, except guess what they also did. <laughs> there are videos of them talking about their recovery with the logo, saying, like, now that I'm at Serenity Hills Acres Farms Park. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh man, that guy is a minute sober. You guys see that? So listen, some of you guys have suffered this in the past. If you need someone to help be objective with you and tell you these are the things you're still suffering from, watch out or they'll kill you. And instead what happens is someone, someone says this, you're terrific, you're great. Mm -hmm. and, and here's why that's dangerous. When you first hear that, you're like, oh, that's, that's showing someone out. <coughs> Imagine though if I'm your oncologist, Casey, and, and in stage four, and you go, how is it, dog? And you go, man, I want to get out of here and tell you racket ball. You're so great. <laughs> you're terrific. <laughs> Doctor, she's dying. And I go, I didn't say what was terrific. I never smiled. It's great. <laughs> well, that's kind of harmful, isn't it? I led her to believe everything is great and she's a fully cooked like turkey coming out of the oven when in fact she's this is a process and it takes a lifetime. Mm -hmm. 
And, and we see that, and sometimes it gets wrapped, it's kind of it's kind of dirty, it gets wrapped in the in the like, uh, oh, well, let's promote awareness of recovery. Yeah, that's good, but this is this is not what that is, right? Thank God when I was four months sober, people didn't advertise me, and I didn't have people lining up to tell me how great I was. I'm so grateful that at four months, I had a guy who sponsored me, and for years I was pretty sure he actively disliked me. I still think he does, right? <laughs> And like Carrie, like Carrie said, I, I'm up, I'm up. My narcissism and my arrogance is potent. I need someone. I need someone to make me look in the mirror when I don't want to, right? And I would call him with this self-seeking stuff, like, my God, just calling you. Why? Why are you calling me? Oh, no, I just got my way home from a meeting. It, was, it ended up, too, but I stacked chairs and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and this, and there's a uh, handicapped guy <laughs> carried across the street. <laughs>
before it is mature. There is something of this worm in the hearts of all religious men. As soon as they have done something which they know to be good in the eyes of God, they tend to take its reality to themselves and to make it their own. They tend to destroy their virtues by planning them for themselves and clothing their own private illusion of themselves with values that belong to God. Who can escape the secret desire to create a different atmosphere from the rest of men? Who can do good things without seeking to taste in them some sweet distinction from the common run of the sinners of this world? This sickness is most dangerous when it succeeds in looking like humility. When a proud man thinks he is humble, his case is hopeless. I, I've been thinking a lot, especially over the last couple of years, about, about spiritual anonymity. And uh, I was lucky, I was blessed, I, was, I, got, I was around my first few years in a crew of people who were relentless about you know, self-seeking and, and self-promoting. And I think a lot of people have forgotten that, that, that first off, everything in the big book is stolen. Everyone knows that right now, right? There's, there's nothing original in there. That principle of spiritual anonymity, it's not to prevent the neighbors from finding out you're an alcoholic. They already know that. <laughs> no, they're not trying to. If you're around me for any period of time, if you didn't know that I was an alcoholic, then you did know that I was, I was eight other types of crazy, which I was. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you'd see my other behaviors. You weren't like, oh, great guy. He cuts himself a bit. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not a manifest in every area of my life. Spiritual anonymity is not, it's not to prevent those people from knowing that we're alcoholics. It's, it's that core idea that we don't talk about enough anymore, principles and core personalities, right? Carrie and I talked about this on the way over here. Uh, we talked about Bill Wilson. And we stumbled upon, like, you know, people said, oh, well, Bill Wilson's a guy. So. <laughs> a lot of shit Bill Wilson did that I'm not going to do. I'll emulate the parts of Bill that were successful. I, I don't, again, we're all imperfect. I don't need to... I don't need to use someone's liabilities and mistakes as my standard. That's, it's easy to do. You guys know in an hour comparison, it's easy. I could steal your wallet. Man, if you stole my wallet, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer ate people too. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can always go down. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's really easy to do that. <laughs> but uh, if we look at our early lineage, like, Bill was sponsored by a guy who didn't even stay sober. Bob was sponsored by a guy who, by Bill, who was never spiritually fit as Bob was. By all those two, Bob's always been my hero, right? <laughs> this is really important. You've all experienced this. You've had people who were wonderful teachers and passed the message on, and then, you, again, they disappointed you because they turned out to be human, right? <laughs> Some of them even relapsed. I've got wonderful friends that I love, and they were on fire, and I learned from them, and guess what happened? They relapsed. Some of them are now dead. Some of them are still in active addiction. It doesn't discount what they did and the people they held. That, that ripples throughout the universe and that's terrific, but the message there and what's really important to remember is it's, it's the process and it's God. And the messenger is largely incidental, you know what I mean? The spiritual anonymity, it's, it's, it's important, it keeps me right side. It's, it's not me. It's not me. And I, I, I have little things I incorporate into my life that seems stupid, I know. At that age, I never use my last name, even when I'm speaking outside of 12 step stuff. And it might seem dumb, but it's, a, it's an important reminder for me. You know, my, my sponsor's Orthodox, highly observant Jew. And when I used to have Shabbos with them, there's like a million different things I do. They're like, no, your left shoe has to come off and rotate 60 degrees before you step on the halal <laughs> Sure, guess what it is? It's your own small sense of self satisfaction because you're so spiritual with it. And when we, when we as a community, when we, when we start to neglect people in our recovery like that, it's, 
It's a, it's a really harmful thing. Because some people never make it back, either physically because they die, or spiritually because the despair becomes like a tsunami and they can never weed their way out of it, right? Yeah. I'm gonna end, I'm gonna end with this last little verse here, which is, is really close to my heart and I really love. Even the professionally pious, and sometimes the pious most of all, can waste their time in competition with one another, in which nothing is found but misery. More than once, Jesus had to rebuke his apostles, who were wrangling among themselves and fighting for the first places in his kingdom. Two of them, James and John, intrigued for the seats on his right and left hand in the kingdom. It is not unusual in the lives of the saints to find that saints did not always agree with the saints. Peter did not always agree with Paul or Philip and Mary with Charles and Mary. And sometimes very holy men have been very exasperating people and tiresome to live with, right? If you do not believe me, perhaps it is because you think that the saints were always perfect and never had any faults to fight against. And from other men. Back to what Carrie said, this is really tricky. A lot of us like to pick, out of any spiritual text, we love to cherry pick, right? Out of the big book, what's our favorite line to take out of context is a get out of jail free card. <coughs> <laughs> this is how my relationship has ended with many sponsees when I say, listen man, here's the truth. I can help you, but if you're not willing to change this behavior, or at least ask for help changing this behavior, our relationship is silly. Imagine if I was a personal trainer and you hired me, and I said, so Will, we're going to meet at World's Gym, and you go, rather meet at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> they have exercise equipment there, no, they got honey rolls. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't feel right taking your money eating honey rolls. Dude, discrimination. You're <laughs> tallest. You know I'm a tall guy. That's <laughs> not real, I don't think, right? <laughs> and I, listen, I, 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 I want to help you, but it, it's not a real relationship if you're not, I'm not asking you to change on a dime, but if you're not willing to say, yeah, this is harmful and I need to change it, then what are we doing, right? And inevitably, what I'll hear somewhere in the midst of that is progress, not perfection. <laughs> progress, not perfection. Read it in context. It makes it pretty clear. This, this doesn't. You read the 15 pages before and the 30 pages after, it makes it really clear. You can even narrow it down, two pages before and three pages after. It makes it very clear. Listen, will you make mistakes? Of course you are. You're a broken and perfect human being. Will you become sicker and relapse as a result? Depends. Do you pick yourself up, ask for help, ask for power, rectify the situation, at the very least cease actively harming other people, or do you, do you go, Whatever, bro, I'm not a saint. <laughs> I'm really sick around shoplifting. But you keep doing it. Just saying you're sick around it doesn't absolve you of the fact that you're responsible for the fact that you're doing something that's harmful over and over again. Right? And that's kind of tricky. So like Harry said earlier, if I'm willing to look into the shadow, if I'm willing to own the things that are keeping me sick, if I'm willing to own my liabilities, check out what this is. It's a really beautiful thing. This is grist for the spiritual mill, right? Without challenges. Without heartache, without things to traverse, to traverse I, how can I grow anymore? You didn't give me any raw materials, right? Very good friend of mine about five years ago, sponsors a million women up in Burlington, Vermont. Everyone loves her. She's funny, she's charismatic, she's doing everything. Out of the blue, she gets hit with this terrible depression, right? And she calls me. And now she's writing 50 pieces of inventory today. She sponsors, you know, she sponsors 20 women. She's doing that thing where she's trying to compensate in all these other areas of her life. She adopted a three-legged cat. She, you, know, you name it, she did it. And she finally called me and she said, I feel like such a fraud. And I say, I said, why do you feel like a fraud? She said, I'm not qualified to sponsor these women. I said, why don't you think you're qualified to sponsor these women? I'm depressed. I'm talking about happy, joy is free. I can't even get out of bed. I said, you did. You're where you are now. And I'm leaving a meeting. I'm a fraud. I said, you, you, women, you're a fraud because you're a human being? No. Oh. And I told her this at the time. We actually met in Portland. And I said, listen, this is grist for the mill. You're navigating this. You're doing what you need to do. And I don't know, and you don't know what you're going to learn from this. I said, but I promise you, when you get through on the other end, I said, a couple years from now, you're going to sponsor a woman. And she's going to be so depressed she can't get out of bed, right? And she's not going to know what she's doing because she isn't drinking. She's not drinking. She's writing her into it. She hit her knees this morning. And whatever you learn from this, guess what you're going to be able to do? You're going to take this pain and you're going to perform alchemy. You're going to be an alchemist. You're going to turn that shit into gold. Mm. And you were going to say, I went through the same thing, and I thought God abandoned me, and I thought the steps weren't working. And I said, I don't know what the resolution is, and you don't either. Maybe it's just that you have to walk through your shit sometimes. Mm -hmm. I said, but you will benefit her. You are carrying rocks for that woman you haven't met yet. You are carrying a load for her. That's real altruism. That's real compassion. 
And she looked at me and she went, I hate you. <laughs> She's a white ass. And I said, about, about what? I said, well, I said, most of it's right. <laughs> sat with her for two hours, and she didn't have a nugget, but here's what she said. I'll feel pain with you right now. I walked through that, right? So all that nastiness, all that stuff, that is grist for the mill. That's your raw material. You, you open your door tomorrow, if there's a three-ton stone out front of your door, you can look at it two ways, right? One is that the kids in the neighborhood have got really advanced in their pranks. <laughs> three-ton piece of granite. <laughs> but imagine this, imagine if like, Bocciari or like Rodin or a sculptor opened the door, guess how they would see it? What a gift! Some anonymous donor, some anonymous benefactor let me sculpt today. Man, this is beautiful. Thank you, right? Praise God. This is beautiful. I'm going to be able to sculpt today. You, you look at your mess and you can, it's all a matter of right? It's spiritual grist for the will. It's something for me to negotiate. It, it will never end, by the way. The day that you transcend your humanity, you should be really worried. And you should put away money for, like, you know, detox and treatment. <laughs> That's a dangerous place to be. You guys remember that Simon Leather episode where Jerry is talking to Newman and he goes, What's up with the post? He goes, The postal service. He goes, Mailman. He goes, Aren't those the guys that freak out and shoot everybody? Yeah. And Newman goes, Sometimes. <laughs> and Jerry goes, Why is that? And Newman goes, It's because the mail never ends. <laughs> Without that, you have no raw material to grow spiritually. You just don't have it. And I'm not saying it feels good, because still to this day, almost 12 years into this, it doesn't feel good for me, and I still complain about it. <laughs> but after I navigate it, guess what I'm really grateful for? Thank you. Thank you for the granite, man. I'm, I'm, a little bit, I'm a little bit closer to God. I've grown a little bit. Just a little bit, right? Here's how he finishes this, and then we'll, we'll finish up. He says... Be content that you are not yet a saint, even though you realize that the only thing worth living for is sanctity. Then you will be satisfied to let God lead you to sanctity by paths you cannot understand. <laughs> you will travel in darkness in which you will no longer be concerned with yourself and no longer compare yourself with other men. Those who have gone by that way have finally found out that sanctity is in everything and that God is all around them. Having given up all desire to compete with other men, they suddenly wake up and find that the joy of God is everywhere. And they are able to exult in the virtues and goodness of others more than they ever could have done on their own. By the way, this is one of those verses that when I first read it, I was like, okay. <laughs> it took me a long and I don't claim to fully understand this, but I will but it's a little bit confusing. And it's like off the field, you kind of read it again, and I go, I don't understand it at all, right? But the power in it is still hitting me. He goes on and says this. They are so dazzled by the reflection of God on the souls of the men they live with that they no longer have any power to condemn anything that's in their life. Even in the greatest sinners, they can see virtues and goodness that no one else can find. As for themselves, if they still consider themselves, they no longer dare to compare themselves with others. The idea has now become unthinkable. It is no longer a source of suffering and limitation. They have finally reached the point where they take their own insignificance for granted. They are no longer interested, for God is love. Love is my true identity. Selflessness is my true self. Love is my true character. Love is my name. <clears throat> that last verse, that hits me now. I'll, just, I'll give you this. That might have as well have been Mandarin Chinese for, you know, my, my, my first couple of years. And I would read that and it would irritate me. For number one, because I didn't understand it, and I don't like when I don't understand things before I establish that. <laughs> And, and I hate even more to ask someone for help, or I, hate to, I really hate to admit when I don't understand something. Or I don't know. It's a terrible way to live life, by the way, right? It took me a long time to taste that, that last verse and get a little inkling. So if, if right now, if you're in a place where you're like, yeah, love is what? It's a love thing, and God is love, and love is God, and love, right? <laughs> Stick with this for a little while. Stick with this for a little while, and, and keep this, no pun intended, like seeds in your head, right? 
and play with that. There are many things in my life that, that someone said to me or I experienced or I read and, and, it, and it sat there kind of dormant until I passed through a certain road. And then, boom. I'm like, oh, man. Right? I got it. So I'm going to end on this. I'm going to leave that, I'm gonna leave that last part for one more time. Ready? To say that I am made in the image of God is to say that love is the reason for my existence. For God is love. Love is my true identity. Selflessness is my true self. Love is my true character. Love is my name. Right? His, his, he does it way better than me, so I'm going to I'm going to end with him in a way even like that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs>